speaker in this panel. Um, face is quite familiar to many of us in the audience. A friend and colleague of museums for many years, um, has served on the board of the Irish Museums Association and has a former chair of the um, Northern Ireland Museums Council. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Crook is a lecturer in, uh, sorry, is a professor. Professor Elizabeth Crook. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, didn't mean to downgrade you there, sorry. <laughs> um, is a professor of heritage and museum studies in the uh, School of Arts and Humanities at Ulster University. Um, and um, she, a lot of her publications, she's published quite extensively on uh, museums, communities, and divided societies. Um, her paper this morning is going to look at museum legacies, the pol politics of empire and nation in the museum space. Um, where she will be exploring some of the tensions between uh, the legacies of empire and Irish nationalism um, in the context of the collections, or as embodied in the collections. Um, I now hand over to Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Gina, for... I'll forgive you of everything, Gina, so you can actually do whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, it's lovely to be um, speaking to you all today, and thank you very much uh, for the organisers for including me in your schedule. So um, the paper I am giving uh, you today is, um, you know, we, we wrote, the, we all wrote our abstracts back in July, and I've slightly tweaked my paper a little bit, Gina. So I hope you enjoy this uh, this piece that I've got for you. Um, and what it does, it focuses on John Hewitt. And John Hewitt was a curator. He worked in this institution, in this building, for about 27 years, from uh, the 1930s. So it, it's, I'm approaching, moving in, looking at an exhibition through the eyes of John Hewitt and what he wrote in his memoirs about his time in the museum. And it still links, Gina's looking slightly horrified at me. <laughs> Don't worry, it still links in. Um, so uh, in his memoirs, uh, the Ulster poet John Hewitt described himself working as art assistant in the Municipal Museum in Belfast in the 1930s. He describes his desk positioned in a narrow alley between tall glass cases dating back to the old Belfast Museum of 1831. In this back room, his cultural, his cur curatorial predecessors are there with him. He cannot help but imagine, in his words, the faces and the hands of his predecessors. He writes as he glances at these glass cases that now and again he, he sees his ancestors there in the space with him. He says, I caught sight of the ghostly distant images of the bewhiskered Gordon Thompson, first settler at Sydney, of the spade bearded Canon Granger, hoarder and bestower of querns and stone axes, of the bland Emerson tenant who bought back from Ceylon the painted dancing masks upstairs, and surely the long bearded visage of the indomitable William Gray. Now, Hewitt was a poet, so of course he writes beautifully about what he sees as he looks uh, through the glass cases and sees these men looking back at him. And we've already had um, uh, Gordon Thompson mentioned today, and I'm sure the other people uh, listed here uh, will be mentioned further on in the conference. But what I'm interested in is a little bit of this legacy. What does it mean to have the ghosts of your predecessors with you when you're working in the museums and in other places like other historic properties? And I think in Northern Ireland, we're very conscious of legacy. We're very conscious of community, of what we belong to. We're very uh, conscious of what is passed down to us and whether we have a duty to continue some family line um, or some professional line. And I think uh, certainly Hannah's paper this morning really shows how we can, we don't have, 
are we're not preordained. We can go do our own thing in museums and challenge uh, preconceptions of museums. But that's what I think is so interesting is how we, how some of these ghosts hang on uh, to us and, and, and envelop us. And in reading that I've done um, around sort of country houses and people working in country houses about feeling the past, um, and I have a lovely quote here about uh, somebody who describes um, that as they move around historic properties and they touch doors and they touch banisters, that they feel their predecessors are touching them. And those that uh, contact becomes a benign, transparent anchors between past, present and future. And with that comes a sense of obligation or responsibility as custodians. And that word custodian is still very much used in the museum world, that we are keeping this uh, public inheritance from the past for the future and all those meanings that are sort of built into that inheritance. So this is sort of what I would like to think about through John Hewitt when he has talked about that legacy and feeling the ghost of his predecessors. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is a particular exhibition that John Hewitt says that caused him to um, have a mental blush. So he talks about um, the, the back rooms of the Belfast Museum as being his graveyard. So sort of relating to the point I've just made about that inheritance. So it's, it's this idea of, of these people always being present in the museum. So his mental blush is in relation to this exhibition. And this exhibition uh, was opened just as the museum opened in 1929. This is the museum just as Northern Ireland was only just you know, barely, not yet 10 years old, so the early stages of Northern Ireland. Um, so this was our Belfast Museum, which was open to great um, celebration in the city. And this is the exhibition Ascent of Man, and uh, opened in, um, the, uh, shortly after it was opened, it, the controversy arose after it, and the controversy predated John Hewitt's employment at the museum. So the controversy was June 1930, and uh, uh, Hewitt joined in November 1930. And the controversy at that time was around uh, the theory of evolution. It was around biological evolution. And uh, people were incensed. They wrote to the Belfast newsletters. The letters make great reading um, of a pandemic evening uh, whenever <laughs> you can't go anywhere else. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, one of the letters. Um, it is a, must, a most unjustifiable um, proceeding to teach this unproved hypothesis to young people or to exhibit illustrations of it in a public museum to which the young as well as the old are admitted. More especially in the case when the theory is, rightly or wrongly, regarded by the vast majority of the community as an affront to their intelligence and an outrage to their Christian feelings. So this letter is very well crafted and in just a few lines, um, the author was able to question the science. Evolution is an unproved hypothesis. The setting of the museum has consequence, referring to the importance of the public space. And there's a suggestion of having to think very carefully about the young and old, as if there are some vulnerability there, and these audiences need protected. So uh, the author admits that the Christian community is finding it difficult to adjust to this new thinking on human origins, describing it as an affront to their intelligence. Not every letter objected to this exhibition. Another one who described himself or herself as an evolution student refers to the fine evolution case in our new museum and says that as a teacher interested in natural history, I am glad to see that our museum is arranging cases in an up-to-date education manner and as a cons consequence hopes to see our schools taking full advantage of the museum. So this is the exhibition that caused John Hewitt to have a mental blush. Now, Hewitt was a socialist, a humanist. He didn't have a funeral. He donated his body to Queen's. Um, and, but there was a, a remembrance service done. There's a cairn in the, in the Moran Mountains in memory of John Hewitt. So he certainly wasn't objecting on the grounds of um, 
of the Christian community, according to the, the letter writers. His mental blush was not how the narrative began, but rather it was a concern without it, how it finished. Hewitt writes of the experience of bringing his friend, the Chinese socialist poet and activist Wang Li Hisi, who introduced himself in Ireland as Shelley Wang, to the Belfast Museum in 1937, where they found themselves in front of the exhibition, The Ascent of Man. Now, this display was in three parts, so you can, there's a far um, display and then you move um, towards me. So the display was in three parts, the geological time periods, the skulls of antiquity and the skulls of the living races of mankind in progressive order. I see Dominic with a big grin. I think he knows what's coming, does he? <laughs> so um, in the slides that follow, I reproduce some of the text from the exhibition and Hewitt's memoirs. And I would like to note that the, some of the language uh, is offensive, um, including even some of the language used by Hewitt. So, um, oh yes, there's the Belfast Telegraph folk. So, um, so Hewitt writes, um, as I stood beside my friend looking, I suddenly realized for the first time that at the tip of the treetop sat the white man's skull. So you can, you can continue reading the quote. And then he said, Wang said not a word, but I knew that he had noticed it and my veins ran shame instead of blood. And I'll just give you a minute to, to read through that. So, Hewitt had been working in the galleries in the museum for seven years. This exhibition had never caused him any offence. It was only when he had this encounter with his friend who had just spent 10 days staying in Hewitt's house. They'd been talking art and philosophy. Um, it was only when he shared the experience of looking at this display did Hewitt see it for what it really was. So, um, and he writes, um, here I was beside a good, even a great man, a man wiser and richer in experience than I would, should ever be. A man who in the past days had given me largesse of his people's wealth of philosophy, folklore, art, history, literature, of a range and a depth far outreaching that of my own people. And yet as we stood together inside the glass case mocking us, the skull of his race was set below the skull of mine without comment or explanation. That instant, for all my shame, I believe I really became a man, not merely an Irish man or a European. And from that time, I face all value judgments on race with a cheerful scepticism. So this was, uh, this was an exhibition that was probably, like it was 1930s whenever John Hewitt is talking about it, um, but it continued for quite a while in the museum. I haven't got an exact date for when it came down, but we reckon, it could have been 10 years at least, maybe longer uh, in the museum. And what I think is really interesting is uh, Hewitt's encounter, Hewitt's seeing it differently only happened when he was with Shelley Wang. But what's also interesting for me is the, the write-up that we see in the newspapers, the record that's, that I found first was the first objection that I shared with you. It would have been so easy for me to have missed this entire point, because this is not something that anybody wrote into the newspapers in Belfast to object to. This was something that so easily could have slipped uh, away out of sight um, from our realisation. And I think this is massively important because this, this is the museum that, you know, this is almost living memory, um, this sort of display. It's the type of exhibition that if my grandparents had been museum visiting people that they would have seen. Uh, so, and John Hewitt, he only died in 1987. So this, this is all, all rather recent. It, it gets worse. Um, this is uh, this image here on the right, which you, you can't see. And it was really difficult for me to read it in the photograph. I had to enlarge it as much as I can and spend some time trying to read it. But again, we can see in the language of this text panel, this, the racism that, that's written into these labels. And what I think is really interesting is, um, this is the sort of thing that can, the, the artifacts go into the back room, uh, text panels can get destroyed. 
But this is, this is what, as I said, that people I would have known would have read if they'd gone into the Belfast Museum. This, this is the environment um, of mid 20th century Northern Ireland. Um, and I think what, what is so tragic is it's still uh, sub keenly felt by some people. And as Hannah said earlier in her paper about the arson attack on the Multicultural Centre in Belfast, this is still a living uh, attitude. Um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting, the work that's going on at the moment in the museum, is how we bring that work outside the museum, or bring those communities in, or mix it all up, depending uh, on what works best um, for, for the different uh, different groups. So um, just to finish off, I think this is, um, this is where we can really think about the purpose of museums, and I think this is what's so interesting. Um, we all know how important museums are. Uh, we read, we write about the importance of, of museums for identity, how important they are for belonging. Um, we can see how museums are used to express empire. We've heard examples of collect everything when you go out to empire. Um, but going back to John Hewitt at the beginning, there are ghosts still present in our museums. And I think that's what's so interesting about how we hide so much in museums, but how things can also now be brought out. And. Uh, our museums can very much tell us about our social and political aspirations as well as our cultural relationships. Silences are recorded by the absence of objects, the absence of people to whom these objects may belong. And as we look to museums and heritage institutions in Ireland, we see the past so easily manipulated, hidden, revived and reinvented. And we've seen that um, with, uh, with this sort of display. And what I've shared with you in this paper is a key moment for an art assistant in the Belfast Museum, a municipal museum that dates back to the 19th century, but uh, opening just as Northern Ireland was founded. And these meanings were put in place by our forefathers and are passed on from generation to generation with increasing critique and growing importance of the essential questions that we must ask. So, and I think what we need to move from is as well as the great work that's going on uh, in our museums that we're hearing about and the greater recognition of the origins of our collections but we need to move on to look to what this means for race and racism and identity at the moment and i'd like to just finish with this quote from hewitt and i think this what he's written here is you know, as we go into a museum, he's not writing about museums, but when we go into museums, we can see a bit of heaven, but we can also see a little bit of hell right beside it. And it's how those two things combine. And we can see the violence that has moved around the globe and blown into our museums. Um, but also we need to ask about hate and hate crime um, that we see happening outside our museum at the moment. Um, and I think we also need to take that responsibility, and I'm really interested in his words, you know, our hate, the hate I give and the hate I am given. And I think that relates back to that idea of inheritance, of the, the, what's going on in families generations ago, what's going on in families and living memory, and those sort of panels and exhibitions that my grandparents would have seen that I lived and grew up with, <laughs> um, and what the implication of that is for ourselves, for all of us here today. So thank you very much, everybody.